Hi there. If you have seen my video on Gunverse 3D, then you will probably have heard about the DBAR paper, which I mentioned quite a few times. This was a key paper for 3D deep learning in 2019. The DBAR paper introduced an improved differential renderer as a tool to solve one of the most fashionable problems right now in deep learning, to generate a 3D object from a single 2D photo. When the DBAR paper was released back in 2019, it also included the source code. But unfortunately, it was missing the machine learning model that was needed to run that code. This was quite disappointing since I really wanted to try this firsthand and so many other people also wanted that. The good news is that now we can try DBAR firsthand because NVIDIA has released the PyTorch library part of NVIDIA Kaolin, which includes DBAR, the same differential renderer that was used in the DBAR paper. But best of all, the library also includes a tutorial that showcases the capabilities of DBAR, the differential renderer. When I first saw the tutorial, I must confess, I didn't really understand the thing. Also, I was not even sure why a differential renderer was even needed. And I even confused the differential renderer DBAR with the neural network described in the DBAR paper that is capable of generating a 3D object from a single 2D photo. They are actually separate things. So in this video, I'm going to show you step by step how to try the DBAR tutorial. And I will also share with you what I've learned about DBAR and this exciting field of 3D deep learning. What are we waiting for? Let's get started. NVIDIA Kaolin has two main components. The NVIDIA Omniverse Kaolin app is an application created by NVIDIA to help 3D uh, deep learning researchers by providing a visualization tool for datasets and a means of generating synthetic datasets and even comes with the capability of visualizing the 3D outputs generated by a model during training. So the NVIDIA Kaolin library is a PyTorch API that supports different 3D representations like point clouds, meshes, and voxel grids, and functions that allow conversion from one representation to the other. The library also includes DBAR, the differential renderer, which is uh, Kaolin.render, and functions to load data from uh, popular datasets like ShapeNet, for example and functions to load 3D models in different file formats like OBJ and USD, Kaolin.io, and an API to create 3D checkpoints, Kaolin.visualize. And in the future, I'm sure they'll add a lot more than that. Before we try to run the DVR tutorial, it is preferable to install the NVIDIA Kaolin app the NVIDIA Kaolin app is going to help us visualize the 3D model, in this case a clock, that we are going to train DVR with. And it's also going to help us navigate the kitchen dataset. In order to install the NVIDIA Kaolin app, we need to first install NVIDIA Omniverse. And for that, you need to download the open beta. You need to uh, then install that in your computer. I'm using Windows, so there's a version available for Windows and uh, uh, I believe also for Linux. So I have now downloaded the NVIDIA Omniverse launcher and I've also installed it. Once you have the NVIDIA Omniverse installed in your computer, you need to start the launcher and uh, you basically uh, go to Exchange, click Apps, then you search here for Kaolin and then click Install. It takes some time to download just be patient and see you again in the future. Okay, so now it's installed. Let's click launch. And that's it, ready to use. This is the data set that was used in a tutorial. It's in this case, it's a kitchen set. So let's download it. So we can open this kitchen set in NVIDIA Omniverse, in this case in the, the Kualin app. That's one of the features that we get. So what's happening here is one of these objects was used to generate those pictures that we saw. And it was the clock, so I'm trying to find where the clock is. I can't see it. 
yeah this this one is the cock so this cock here was used to create the different uh, shapes so using the data generator we can create the these views of this 3d object this is the cock here well it looks good We can ease our pain so much by using Anaconda. With Anaconda it's easy to install multiple versions of Python and with the use of virtual environments we can greatly reduce the chances of binding uh, incompatible versions of a library. If you don't have uh, Anaconda installed you can follow one of my previous videos to complete the Anaconda setup. I will include the link in the description. Let's start by creating a conda environment for everything that we need for uh, installing Kaolin. So I'm going to open the command prompt and we're going to call conda create minus minus name Kaolin Python 3.7. So this will create a new environment. So now let's activate the new environment. Okay. So let's now clone the Kaolin project. Okay. So the next step now, it should be switching to a branch. Uh, for example, the latest uh, release is uh, version 0.9.0. So you would do something like this. Actually, sorry. Um, first, I need to go to Kaolin and then I can change to the branch. So this is what you advise to do. But because the DBR tutorial that we want to try is only in master, it hasn't been uh, released yet. We need to uh, use master for this specific case. But when you watch this video, chances are there's already a new release of DBR. So I will check that first because more often than not, you're better off using a static release branch than trying to, you know, run code that's in, in master because normally the code that's in master is, is quite unstable. So I'm going to go back to master because that's the only choice I have right now. But I don't advise you to do that unless, you know, you need to try the debar tutorial, which is what I'm trying to demonstrate to you today. Now that we are in the master branch, let's uh, uh, first install PyTorch. It was rather quick because I used Conda instead of pip. Now that we've installed uh, PyTorch, it's time to build the Kaolin library. So we just finished the setup of the Kaolin library. Let's check uh, to see if we can import some of the Kaolin library dependencies. Well, it looks good. So I think it's time to try and uh, run our tutorial for the first time. The DBAR tutorial, which we can now find on GitHub, is about showing you how the DBAR differential renderer works and how it can be used to recover 3D model structure and texture from multiple 2D images as a pure optimization problem. But more importantly, what it is not. It is not a tutorial on how you can generate 3D models from a single 2D image using a neural network that was described in the second part of the DBAR paper. You'll see later that when we step through the code for the tutorial, that it's actually not using a neural network. The problem of converting a 2D image to its 3D uh, scene is the inverse problem of traditional computer graphics, hence the name inverse graphics. Easier said than done, inverse graphics is quite difficult because traditional rendering pipelines like OpenGL, or DirectX were never designed to allow recovery of the 3D scene being rendered. These pipelines were developed to be efficient and they contain a lot of optimizations which causes some of the 3D scene information to be lost. I think it is worth talking about what the differential render is and why it is needed. A 2D photo is a projection of a 3D scene on a 2D plane. A 3D scene is a collection of 3D meshes vertices, 
faces, texture maps and a light source, viewed from a camera or viewpoint. For simplicity, let's limit our 3D scene to a single 3D object. If we were able to recover the original 3D scene that produced the 2D photo, we should be able to verify it by projecting the given object in 3D to 2D using the same viewpoint that was used to generate the input 2D photo. In order to reconstruct our 3D object, a brute force approach would be to calculate every single possible combination of vertices, faces, light sources, and textures, which when projected to 2D would produce an equivalent image in 2D as the one given as input, as long as the camera position is the same. This is essentially a search problem, but the problem with a brute force attempt is that there are a gazillion combinations of verses, faces, texture maps, and lighting that can be created. So unfortunately, we can't brute force our way out of this problem. Let's try to find a smart way. How about we start with a, an initial mesh, for example, a sphere, which is uh, topologically similar to the 3D object we are trying to recover, for example, a clock. And then we try to make changes so that we mold this sphere to be similar to the clock. We can make changes at different levels. We can move vertices around and we can change the colors of the, in the texture. We can change the input lighting and so forth. To verify that we are converging, I mean getting closer to the target shape, in our case, a clock, at each step, we need to project our molded sphere to 2D using a similar viewpoint as the input to the image and verify that the two images are similar. The, the farther they are apart, that means the more changes we have to make to the sphere. But Houston, we have a problem. To convert from a 3D scene to 2D, we need to use a graphics rendering pipeline. In a traditional computer graphics pipeline, a rasterization technique is used to render a 3D scene onto a 2D scene. And during the process of projecting a 3D image to a 2D plane, rasterizing triangles and shading pixels, there is a loss of information due to the algorithms and the optimizations that are used in the graphics pipeline. The problem with these losses is that they introduce discontinuities in the image. This means that often making minor changes to the geometry might not result in a different image at all, or perhaps worse, the image will suddenly change, leaving us farther from the target uh, to the image. This is a no-no. Because of these two uh, problems, we have no way to know in which direction to go in our search. And that makes recovering the original 3D scene from a 2D photo very difficult if we are only relying in a traditional graphics pipeline. So it seems that we need to design our own rendering pipeline, aka differential renderer. This new rendering pipeline will guarantee that for each change in the input 3D object, there is a guaranteed change in the projected 2D image and its pixels. And this change will be a gradual change for every pixel. Furthermore, each generated pixel will have derivatives that can be used to determine, I mean backpropagate, the original inputs that contributed to the final value of each pixel. Luckily, we don't have to reinvent the wheel. DVAR is a differential renderer that models pixel values using a differentiable rasterization algorithm. It has two methods of assigning pixel values. One, foreground pixels, and another for background pixels. For uh, foreground pixels, I'm going to quote directly from the paper. Here, in contrast to standard rendering, where a pixel value is assigned from the closest face that covers it, we treat foreground rasterization as an interpolation of vertex attributes. For every foreground pixel, we perform a Z-buffering test and assign it to the closest covering face. Each pixel is influenced exclusively by this face. So in summary, foreground pixels are calculated as an interpolation of the nearest three adjacent vertices using different weight for each vertice. In this way, we calculate the intensity for each pixel. 
For background pixels, which are pixels that are not covered by any face of the 3D object, the pixel value is calculated based on the distance from, from the pixel to the nearest face. But the DBAR tutorial doesn't use a GAN nor any neural network. Instead, it's just a simple demonstration how we can use DBR, the differential renderer, in conjunction with PyTorch to solve an optimization problem in regards to recovering uh, 3D geometry and texture iteratively from multiple viewpoints of the same object and only using 2D supervision. This first block of code, we are collecting, basically we're just referring to the directors we need. And you can see here a reference to the render clock directory. The way you can get this render clock directory is you need to unzip this file here, renderclock.zip, and this contains all the files that we need. And then if you look at these uh, files, uh, you can see that there's a total of 100 views of the clock. Each basically image contains the image itself, of course, and it contains the metadata, uh, which has camera properties, and then it contains a semantic file, which gives you uh, information about, it's basically a semantic mask. This uh, directory was actually generated by the Kaolin app. I will show you later how we can generate our own training data, not for a clock, but for example, for a, a ball. This item here comes from the kitchen data set, for, which was open sourced by uh, Pixar. And uh, basically there's a lot of items that we can try, but not all the items will work very well with this tutorial because this tutorial uh, was designed to be quite simple. So they picked the clock because it's a relatively simple shape, which is quite topologically similar uh, to a sphere. Anyway, so the first block of code refers to that directory where all the training data is, which was synthesized by Cowin app. And then there is this logs path. This directory is where all the training will output uh, the results. So during the training, we're going to be creating a time lapse. So at, at, at each epoch, we're going to be saving the state of the training. And the idea is that later on, we're going to be visualizing how the training went. And that's why we need this logs path directory. As you can see here, it's been referred here. This is quite useful. I'll show you later how it looks like. So here we have uh, in the second block, we have some hyperparameters, the number of epochs, the batch size, Laplacian weight, flat weight, and so on. Uh, these two attributes are quite important for uh, making sure that our surface uh, remains smooth. In fact, you'll see quite a lot of references about regularizers. In If you look at the papers uh, about 3D uh, deep learning, you'll find that uh, often during this process of trying to reconstruct a 3D shape, you need to use regularizers to uh, keep the surface of the shape you're trying to reconstruct fairly smooth and also with less uh, self-intersecting uh, faces. So let's run this. Okay, so here we are starting to parse our, our training data and uh, it's a simple one where we are using the data loader from PyTorch to load each different uh, uh, view of the clock and we're basically uh, pinning this into memory so that whenever we start the training uh, using the GPU it will be quicker so that's why pin memory is set to true here so let's do that also note here this method this is a method uh, from the the Kaolin uh, API and this method uh, understands the, the structure of this information here. Of course, it can read an image, but it also understands this metadata JSON. So we will take the camera parameters from there and it will also be looking for the semantic mask. So this is a, an API method, it's quite important, saves you a lot of time. So if you didn't have this, then you would have to uh, manually parse everything. Right, so next one is uh, we're going to be loading a sphere template. This sphere is going to be uh, molded into the shape we're trying to reconstruct. I can even show it in Blender how it looks like so you have an idea. So let's just open Blender. And now I'm going to import the OBJ uh, file. 
which has the sphere. So this is our sphere. This is a, a sphere with, I don't know how many vertices, but it has a, a fixed number of vertices. And that's what we're going to be molding it to look like a clock. So let's go to sphere. Okay, so next section. So this is a tricky one. So I'll try to explain it as best as I can. So in this uh, notebook, we are setting up the loss function. And the loss functions have uh, two purposes here. So the first the purpose is to make sure that whenever we're molding the sphere, we are able to stop when our sphere is more or less looking the same way as a clock. So we calculate two types of losses. One is the, an L1 loss, as it says here. In this case, we're, we're not comparing 3D objects because we are only doing 2D supervision. So whenever we are trying to check at the end of, uh, during the training for each step that the sphere itself is closer to the clock, we always uh, do a projection using the differential render to 2D, right? And when we do this projection to 2D, afterwards we do a comparison of the 2D projection using, of course, the same uh, camera viewpoint as what is in uh, ground truth. And we compare the two images to check what differences that we have. And that's called the uh, L1 loss because it's uh, an absolute difference. Then there is another type of loss we're calculating. And this is where we use the segmentation mask from the ground truth and we compare with the mask uh, that we get from, so it's somewhere here, let me just check. So soft mask, anyway, the soft mask is that, which is here, mentioned here. So we basically do a comparison of the two masks and we do an intersection over union, which is basically a measurement on how much the two different uh, uh, areas overlap. And then, of course, uh, we are looking for minimizing the differences. So the loss in this case will, the closest to zero, the better. Okay, so this is the first type of loss we're calculating. And this is mainly to make sure that we get to the right shape. Then we have another type of loss, which is um, meant to be there to avoid undesirable uh, geometries. Like, for example, self-intersecting shapes or, um, uh, for example, uh, jagged edges and so on. So that's the Laplacian loss and the flat loss. Those are the two ones there. Okay, so this is what this is. These two type of regularizers, the Laplacian loss and the flat loss, you will see uh, if you look at a, a few um, 3D deep learning papers, which I'm going to put that into uh, an article that you can uh, read. I also collected, by the way, a playlist with all the videos that are relevant uh, to this. Uh, so you feel want to learn more about uh, 3D deep learning and you'll find a common thread where uh, one of the concerns that the researchers have is that whenever they are trying to reconstruct a 3D shape, they've noticed that unless they use these regularizers, the shapes they get are going to have self intersecting faces or uh, jagged edges and so on. So they use those two. I'll be curious actually to see what happens if I take these two losses. Let's see. Maybe we just do a quick experiment to see how it looks like. Okay, so I'm just going to uh, run this. And okay, the next bit, uh, it's more typical uh, machine learning thing. Uh, we are setting up an optimizer. So we're using Atom, which is a very popular algorithm for updating all the different learning parameters. So we have here three parameters that we are learning. So the vertices of the sphere in this case, the, those are the things we are updating. The texture map and the vertice shift. So we're using Atom and then we specify the, the learning rate and so on, okay? So the idea is that we're going to be adjusting our, the parameters we're trying to learn according to the Atom algorithm. You might be wondering what the vertice shift is for. Uh, it's quite obvious what the vertices are and the texture map because we're trying to we're trying to optimize our shape so we have to move the vertices around and we also optimizing our texture to make to make it look like the clock and so that's quite obvious but what is the vertice shift for from my understanding uh, is that whenever you change the shape of the actual uh, shape and I can show you the algorithm here I think it says it there kind of tries to explain it uh, so there's a method here 
whenever we do the training, at each step, we try to recenter all the vertices in the sphere according to this parameter vertice shift. So whenever you change the shape of the sphere, the center of gravity will change. At least that's, that's how I understand it. And in order to compensate for that, we use this parameter vertice shift to recenter the vertices. Okay. If you have any other ideas on why this is done, uh, I'll be uh, happy to be corrected, to be honest. But I think I'm not too far off from the, from what's being done here. Okay, so, so we have, we've run the optimizer, now let's just do the training. And before we run the training, let's just quickly go through the important bits here. So we're going to be running this training for 40 books. And what we are doing is basically for each book we go through the total number of views of the clock that we have as the ground truth. And the total number of views is actually 100. For 100 views, we do an iteration. So for each view of the ground truth, it's one step, right? So at epoch zero, the first epoch, right? The, before we do anything, we start with the normal sphere. And then at the end of each step, we basically change the, the actual sphere itself. We mold it, right? Okay, so for each step, we we call this method recenter vertices, which we, we just talked about. And then here we're using div r, the differential renderer. After we've uh, made the change to the sphere according to the uh, the parameters that we have, vertices, texture map, and the vertice shift, we convert the sphere which is being molded into 2D using the same view that we are iterating for right so we have the ground truth the ground truth has 100 views and for each view we basically convert our sphere to that view uh, to make sure that we can compare then the view of the sphere according to the view of of the ground truth that we have okay and so that's why we're using a uh, dbar here to to convert everything to 2d then we calculate all the different losses that we need to do we need to use these losses to back propagate that information so we can adjust the values of the three parameters we are trying to learn. So you have here these two key methods, which are for, uh, so loss backward uh, calculates the gradients. The idea is to figure out what changes we have to make to the parameters that we are uh, optimizing or we're trying to learn. And then the step, dot step here will change those three parameters the texture map and the, and the vertex shift. And basically this is a loop, right? So it keeps going. So we, we keep improving the sphere, shaping it in a way it should be shaped until we get to the point where we, we reach the, the last epoch, which is uh, epoch 39. And then we have our result, okay? Here, we are also um, updating the time-lapse. So this is going to update the the logs directory that I mentioned you, to you before so we get a time a snapshot of how the sphere looks like at the end of, of each epoch. Okay, so let's run this in AppDoc. So you can see here that it's actually um, running. Then the loss starts with a relatively high value and it should go down as we go along. Okay, it has completed the training. So now we can visualize uh, how the clock looks like after the, the 40 epochs. So you can see that this is one of the views. Uh, so we're basically doing, taking the 3D mesh and taking a, a picture of the 3D mesh in a random uh, camera position. And that's what we get. And then this is a texture map. And then let's open this again in the Kaolin app and uh, let's take a look at how the training progressed and what is the actual uh, look and feel of the final 3D shape we, we've managed to uh, create. So here I'm going to use the training visualizer. Okay, so this is the clock and we can see here how the training went. So it this is the final iteration, 39. So let's start with zero. As you can see, this is how it started. And as the number of iterations increased, then the clock looked more and more like what is uh, the final look is. As you can see, the different perspectives of the clock. 
So it started with a sphere, then it increasingly went and took the shape of the clock. Simple as that. You can see the shape reconstruction. It's not perfect, but anyway. So that's it. Okay, so this is the standard tutorial for uh, the differential renderer. So let's just now try and generate our own synthetic data. I'm going to open here a data set. Basically, this is from where this clock came from. So I'm going to open the kitchen set. And you can see here, a lot more options that we can try. So, so we have here quite a few things we can try and, and this could go very wrong but you know so let's try a bow yeah so let's try and reconstruct the bow the bow actually has things inside it so it has cheerios but we just want to reconstruct the bow so what we're going to do we're going to use the data generator and we're going to open the folder which has the bow so this is the bow and we're going to generate an rgb image a semantic segmentation and that's about it. So we're going to do 100 renderers instead of one. We're going to randomize the distance of the camera, the elevation and the azimuth. And here I'm just going to change this to look back to the bow. So the camera is always facing the object. Then the lighting, I'm, I'm not going to enable lighting or camera light. I'm only going to use the sun. So light from the sun only. And you can see actually it looks different. It looks more pink now. You can actually uh, specify the type of lighting you want. You can do path tracing or ray tracing. I'm going to leave ray tracing. So let's do a preview. As you can see, uh, we see the, the ball from different perspectives. And that's exactly what you want. So we can try and reconstruct it. So we need to export, specify an output directory. So we can place all the, the different assets in the same place examples samples so we're going to create a new folder render it bow then select so now we're going to export it actually i think one problem with this is that the object itself changes size because it the camera sometimes it's closer i should make that fixed okay let's try that one instead so i fixed the distance for the camera so the the bow is is always more or less the same size i think that's better so let's try again okay now Let's give it a go and see what happens. So I'm going to try and replace, instead of using the renderer clock as the, the source of data here, I'm going to use the rendered ball. Going to restart everything. Let's run it and see what happens. Okay, now the, the training has finished. So let's see how it looks like. All right. Okay, so this is how the ball looks like. It seems to have like a little bit of, uh, well, it's not perfect, but it looks like he has something sticking out. That was also showing up in the in the clock. So let's open the training uh, folder and see how it looks like. I think it's in the same location. You can see this is okay. Interesting. It started with a sphere. Interesting. Anyway. This is what I got with a different object. So it didn't quite get there. It didn't go exactly according to plan, but I wasn't really expecting uh, great results either, uh, mainly because there is more variables that uh, need to be taken care of. And that's it. I hope you found uh, this uh, long tutorial useful. I hope you understand a little bit more about 3D deep learning. And if you do, uh, don't forget to smash the like button. And I hope to see you again soon. Happy coding.